Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, wherever all you lovely people are in the world. Do me a favor and let me know if you can hear me okay. Um, I feel like it's been forever since I last tried to do a live stream here in my garage. All right, good. It sounds like everybody can hear me just fine. You know, as I was uh, taking a shower, cleaning myself up, and getting uh, getting ready for tonight, you know, it's just it's one of those things where it, it it really dawned on me that this is going to be my last live stream in the room that started my whole YouTube career. You know, because when I when I started my channel about four years ago, um, first was like I said, fitness stuff and uh, a couple of programming stuffs, and then I had a couple of uh, videos of me in my um, pool room uh, doing uh, basic videos and stuff. Uh, Bogart, thank you so much for subscribing to my YouTube channel. Um, and when my when my pull videos basically started allowing my um, YouTube channel to start to become popular. And I started noticing I was getting subscriber after subscriber after subscriber. Um, I eventually set aside all of the fitness stuff and all of the programming stuff and just focused strictly on pool. And I've been doing that for the past four years. You know, and then since the last time I went live, I talked about uh, where I, I did a review of my match against uh, professional pool player Roland Garcia uh, trying to send the message of how does a, you know, six, uh, I think it was a 642, or I'm currently a 642 Fargo rated player, but how does the 600 plus Fargo rated player match up against an 800 um, plus uh, Fargo rated player? And I had talked about how I'm going to be moving, and that is still true. Um, so the reason why you haven't seen anything from me in quite some time is because I've been preparing my home for the market. The only thing I haven't had to do was dismantle this room because it was my realtor's suggestion that I should leave this room functional so that um, any potential buyers can see what they can do with this garage, given that there's a mini split in here so that way you can control the temperature or you can still just use it as a garage. So it's supposed to be kind of a nice focal point uh, uh, to showcase um, you know, having a man cave or just uh, having a garage. And then once I actually have a buyer that closes on the house, then I empty uh, this, this entire garage. <clears throat> and yeah, it, I have to say that it, it felt kind of, it felt kind of sad knowing that this is where it all started and where I'm about to take it to when I move into my new home and try to get a new setup because I am going to try to upgrade my eight foot table to a nine foot table. Um, the, I, I, I'm planning on having the table actually be in the house in a room, you know, a, a game room. Um, and the, that game room has to be big enough to be able to support a nine footer. And then so how I'm going to be able to set up my lights, set up my microphones, uh, and my cameras and stuff. And I currently don't have a clue what it, what it's all going to look like um, until I eventually get there. So having said all that, though, um, I decided that what I can do tonight is whatever y'all want me to do. Um, I can clearly I saw some uh, comments in the chat. I can clearly try to do some straight pull tonight. Um, I can try some nine ball ghost with either the one on the spot or the nine on the spot with or without the uh, break box, you know, with or without match room rules, with or without ball in hand after the break. Um, I can do some 10 ball ghosts. Um, I can attempt to do some live lessons. Um, I'm just here for y'all since this is my, my last live stream and um, I will let all of y'all dictate the show. So um, light up the chats uh, with uh, what you'd like uh, to see me try. Um, and it'll be one of those things to where like, if I do, if I see some more straight pull suggestions, I'll do a couple of attempts of high run straight pull attempts, and then I'll come over here and then see what the next suggestion is. And if the next suggestion I see is like play the ghost, then I will play the ghost in a race. And then after that, and just kind of 
just kind of keep going back and forth um, until I get tired of streaming and, and then uh, happen to call it a night. So <clears throat> while y'all figure out uh, what it is that y'all would like me to do, uh, let me give a shout out to all of my sponsors on board Sportswear, the maker of the jerseys of the Moscone Cup that I actually have in the background there that you can't really see unless I lift up uh, or raise the camera up a bit, which I can actually do for y'all before I forget. I forgot I have the, the capabilities of doing that. As you can also see, the microphones are in the way as well, but they're the company that makes the jerseys for the Moscone Cup. But they also make uh, custom jerseys for you know yourself or your league teams. And so if you feel like you want to um, own a set of jerseys for yourself, visit their website, onboardsportswear.com or onboardsportswear.us if you live in the United States, and use my discount code LILCHRIS10 and get 10% off your purchase. We see Outsville. They are the, oh, my head's in the way. They are the makers of the AccuRack. That is a template rack, and they also are the maker of the ghost rack that, well, never mind. The, there we go. They also are the maker of the ghost rack that you see on my table here that I use for a uh, straight pull. And it's basically a template rack. So that way you can have the perfect rack every time where all of the balls are touching and then therefore get a consistent, uh, consistent break. They also have a lot of other products um, on their sites. I know they do their own tips. Uh, they have um, their own versions of chalk, a um, bunch of other uh, uh, pool accessories, but they're well, they're mostly well known for their AccuRack or their template racks. And so if you'd like to order a set of your own AccuRacks and have the perfect rack every time that you break, uh, visit their website, outsville.com and use my discount code, Lil Chris, L-I-L apostrophe space, C-H-R-I-S. And you have to spell it like that because if you don't, the discount code does not work. But that discount code will get you 10% off of your purchase. And then I think after, um, or there we go, after Outsville is town, um, I don't have a discount code with them anymore, but I do uh, still support using their products because I use their glove, um, I use their chalk, and I use their tips. I'm currently shooting with a town fusion on both the queue that I have here in my garage uh, that I use for YouTube and the queue that I actually use when I play in tournaments and in leagues. Um, I've tried the uh, town pro uh, soft tip um, and haven't had any complaints with that, but since I switched to the town fusion, it took a little bit of getting used to, but um, afterwards, the more I hit with it, the more I start to like it. I can't really venture to say if I like one more over than the other, I think it's just fair to say that the more you start to use something, as long as you give your due diligence in trying it out, you may or you eventually come to a decision on whether or not if you like it. And with the Town Fusion tip, I do in fact like it. Uh, let's see, the ICA training system. <clears throat> that is the system that I've had on my uh, channel here a couple of times where I have a projector that's um, on my ceiling here that will shine onto my table. That's something else I can happen to demonstrate. Or, or do uh, later tonight if uh, if y'all would like. And it allows you to basically mark where all the balls are at, um, or you can create drills. Um, there's actually um, other, dr there's already drills that are loaded into the system. So that way you can practice um, any style of, uh, any skill set that you would want to be able to practice. And the biggest advantage that you have with using the ICA training system is being able to Mark where balls are going to be at, mark target locations, uh, uh, where target locations are going to be at that you might want to end up uh, transitioning your cue ball without having the use of reinforcement labels. Uh, because you can clearly use reinforcement labels as a substitute. It's just that when you're done with everything, you have to pick up all the reinforcement labels. And if you start doing uh, more training later on, you have to put new ones back down. The drawback, I guess I would say, with the ICA training system is that it's expensive. Right, um, I can't BS you about that. It is expensive, but I definitely think it's worth the cost uh, because as Shortstop on Pool describes it, you're buying a computer. You know, it's, it's, it's a Raspberry Pi that has an operating system on it and, in, uh, and on that Raspberry Pi is the ICH uh, training software, which is basically functioning off of a computer and gives you all the features uh, that are available. And so if you think something like that is worthwhile in investing in helping your pool game uh, uh, get better, then this is something that I would highly uh, recommend. So if you check out their website, icatraining.com, uh, you can use my discount code LC, and that'll give you $50, not a percentage, a flat $50 off of the bundle that's the first item that you see on their website, 
or off of just the software, which comes on an SD card. And then we have Moonlighting Billiards. They're the company that makes these cutout templates for you to be able to set up drills in a straight line or in a curve or semicircle type of pattern. They have their drill partner, which is a uh, straight line template that can uh, have a set of nine balls in a straight line. Or they have their road edition, which is the drill partner cut into thirds. So you can have a straight line of just three balls. Um, I've demonstrated the, uh, the templates um, on my uh, channel before where I can, I can set up like a, a straight line of nine balls um, or a th uh, three by three grid um, of balls. And they also have curved templates. And each one of the curved templates can have up to two balls inside of them. And then uh, when you put the curved templates together, you can create semicircles or full circles. If you uh, can't afford the ICA training system and you don't want to hassle yourself with uh, putting the balls evenly spaced apart with like a ruler or something, then these templates would definitely uh, fit the bill for that. So if you visit their website, moonlightingbilliards.com, you can use my discount code LILCHRIS10 and get 10% off of your purchase. And then last but not least, JFlower Cues. I've been now officially using their cues now for a little over, um, I, I think going on a year, uh, but I've been working with JFlowers for a couple of years now. Um, I've done some product reviews of their cues, and like I said, I currently shoot with their cues, and I'm currently using the SMO carbon fiber shaft, and the SMO stands for Strickland, uh, Morris, and Orcorio, the three professional uh, sponsored players that had some input going into designing how that shaft uh, plays. And yeah, it's still one of those things to where when I compare it up against the Revo from Predator, I mean, it, it competes with it. I can't sit here and try to tell you that it's better and I'm not gonna do that even though I'm a sponsored player. What I can tell you is that I've done a live demonstration between the SMO shaft and the Revo to show the deflection differences. And what I had done is I set up a straight in shot um, and I, the, the, if I remember correctly, I had the object ball about three feet away from the pocket and then I had the cue ball about two feet away from the object ball uh, and then I marked where my bridge hand was going to be, which is about a foot away from the cue ball. And so I would line up uh, the shot center to center and then I would move, I would uh, parallel move my cue because normally I'm a backhand English player if everybody uh, follows me long enough. But I would move my entire cue over uh, to apply left or right spin to try to um, try to enforce cue ball deflection to occur. And so if the deflection is big enough, then that means I should miss the straight in shot. And what I was able to demonstrate with the um, SMO shaft is that I was able to apply side spin, still make the ball, and then you can watch the cue ball still spinning on the horizontal axis as it follows after the ball, and sometimes it would scratch, and then sometimes it would just barely miss the pocket. And then when I did the same thing with the, uh, when I did the test with the Revo, I was able to produce roughly the same similar results. I just can't tell you, like, by the millimeter how much of a difference of the deflection was, but roughly the same exact results. So based on that, the only thing I can say is that the SMO shaft is $100 cheaper than the, uh, than the Revo. So at that point, it's pretty much at your uh, choice as to which carbon fiber shaft do you want to try. I think everybody would agree that it usually uh, it's okay to go a little bit cheaper and, and still get the same results. <laughs> but I don't have a discount code uh, with them anymore, but I do support their products. But I do have a referral code. A lot of times I still get questions on how can uh, people uh, support me. You know, I don't ask for donations um, or anything like that because I work a regular nine to five job, um, you know, but donations are always appreciative. Um, but one way you can support me is that if you decide to try any JFlower products, um, I do believe in the description of this live stream should be my referral code. Let me double check that real quick. Do, do, do. Oh, it's not there. So I need to give y'all um, my referral code. So give me just a second. And what happens is, is if you make a purchase using my referral code, then I obviously get some credit um, for uh, uh, basically allowing the sale. And 
what that credit does for me is it gives me store credit. Now you might ask yourself, well, what does a sponsored player ha uh, need with store credit when I can almost get anything that I want uh, from J Flowers, you know, as a, as a sponsored player? And you'd be right. I don't need the store credit. So that's why what I said in the last live stream, what I am planning on doing with my store credit is that when it's high enough, then what I'm going to do is just purchase a queue or purchase a case or purchase some sort of product from their website using my store credit, probably do a product review of whatever it is that I purchase, and then give it away to a lucky subscriber. So what that basically means is not only would you be helping me, but you'd be helping the community. So here in the chat, I have put my referral code. So if you actually just click on this referral code, it'll take you straight to the J Flowers website. And if you do happen to make a purchase of anything, like I said, I will get the store credit for it. And then when it's when the amount of money or the amount of store credit that I have is high enough to purchase a queue, maybe purchase a queue with an SMO shaft, you know, a tip of a tip of a, um, a follower's choice. I don't know. It it just really depends but it'll be just something for me to be able to give back to the community. So that means the community is also helping the community as well. Okay, so I think that's enough of that. Let's see, I'm gonna go through the chat and see uh, what suggestions um, have been asked. Oh, but I do recall seeing this question here and I do wanna highlight it. Cue ball control sometimes it says he has room for a nine foot diamond. Um, is an eight foot best in my opinion, because I play on larger and smaller tables. Well, I grew up playing on nine foot tables. And when I knew that I was going to have a pool table here in my garage, I wanted to have a nine foot table, but a nine foot table cannot comfortably fit here in my garage. I mean, even with this eight foot table, there are still some times where um, I can risk hitting the hitting the back wall uh, with with my cue. So a nine foot table in here would just make it worse. But the reason why I went ahead and purchased an eight foot table anyway is because in this particular area we're dominated by leagues, which plays in which plays on seven foot tables. But now I do play in a uh, nine foot table league um, in at Skinny Bob's in Round Rock. But if everybody watched my last live stream. Uh, where I played Roland Garcia on a nine foot table, even though I practiced strictly on an eight foot table, hopefully y'all saw that. I mean, at least in my opinion, I thought I put up a pretty good fight um, against Roland Garcia on a nine foot table. So it's really hard to say other than if you're at least, you know, on point with your cue ball transitions, it does. It obviously doesn't matter whether or not if it's an eight foot table, seven foot table, or a nine foot table. If the cue ball is only a few feet away from the object ball, the size of the table probably does not matter. That would be like, for example, if I ask you to set up a uh, set up an object ball two feet away from the pocket, and then start with a straight in shot one foot away, you'd probably be able to hit that shot ten times out of ten, twenty out of twenty, whatever. But then I would ask you to take that cue ball and move it back like five or six feet. And how many times could you, uh, could you hit it? You know, probably not 100%. There might be times where you might actually miss. Which goes to say that when you have a shot and the object ball is further away from the, uh, from the cue ball, that's where there can be some more difficulty. So clearly, having a nine foot table helps alleviate that because you get to practice shooting those types of long distance shots. So shooting a full table shot here on an eight foot table is not the same thing as shooting a full table shot on a nine foot table because of that extra foot of distance, you have to be able to um, accurately judge the depth perception to be able to still accurately hit the object ball. But is it really gonna be that big of a difference? I'm probably gonna have to say no. So in my opinion, I, I, I can't say an eight foot table is best. I still just kind of just boil it down to it being personal preference. So cue ball control sometimes. I hope that uh, answers your question. All right, let's see here. Let 
Oh, this is a good question uh, before I still go into um, the way things go. It's from George Henley. It says, how much has my Fargo gone up in the last four years um, with uh, all the stuff that I've recorded uh, from Demetrius and others? Before I met Demetrius, I was at a 610, 615-ish uh, frame. And then after um, I had gotten my first training uh, with Demetrius and started trying to implement the processes and stuff, I eventually um, got third place at a 10 ball state event um, that skyrocketed my Fargo up to like the 640s. But then over the course of time, as I started to compete more in like tournaments and other types of leagues, my Fargo started to drop. And my Fargo eventually settled in um, around 628 to 632-ish um, area. But then lately, within the past few months, especially since I've been playing on a night foot table league um, uh, at Skinny Bob's now, my Fargo has started to climb back up. And I think last I checked, it was settled in at about a 642. So when you think about it, 614 to 642, that is what, a 28 point uh, jump? Now, mind you, you have to also take into consideration that because I work a nine to five job um, as well, I don't be able, I'm, and I'm not able to compete um, as often as I would like. Um, if, I, if I had uh, more time to be able to compete, could my Fargo rate go up a little bit higher? Maybe, maybe it could also go down a little bit lower, you know, but hopefully um, after I move, I'll actually be um, closer um, to other types of tournaments that hopefully rep report to Fargo. So we'll eventually see in the next uh, few months, few years or whatever, how my Fargo rate uh, continuously begins to fluctuate from there. But I think from a 614 to a 640, uh, 642 is a pretty good uh, significant jump, uh, considering the amount of time that I'm actually able to put into the game. So thank you for the question, George. All right, so I see some jump ball lessons. I see running through some drills. Still see some more stuff about jumps. Road to 100, so we definitely want to see some straight pull. Okay. So I can start with the, um, the jump lesson. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, let's see here. So I hide this and as I mentioned before, it's been a while uh, since I've been here. So I don't know how echoey um, it still sounds uh, when I'm out here, uh, but I do need to know, can you hear me okay as I walk around the table and, and talk without trying to really elevate my voice and stuff just to make sure that I don't have to shout uh, so everybody can hear me. So can you let me know how I sound um, out and about the, uh, the table? Okay, good. <clears throat> now, I did see a comment asking about getting the, getting the cue ball to jump quickly. Well, Unfortunately, I'm not going to cover that because the the comment that I read, I think this was from uh, loping. I think it was from loping CSF. Basically said that he can jump a ball that's about this far away. It's a matter of what about like when the cue ball is this far away or, or closer. Well, probably nine times out of ten, if the imposing ball is this close to the cue ball for me, I'm probably going to end up kicking at it. But if it's about this far away then I'm probably gonna go ahead and jump. And even though I've got um, a video about jumping, there was one tip that, complete, that I got that completely changed the way that I jump. And that was from Nate Mindham from the Cue It Up Network. When I finally got to meet him in person, when we went to London uh, for my first uh, Moscone Cup trip, um, and we got to play some pool together and stuff. And he's a, he's a better player than me. I'm, I have no problem admitting that. And he gave me some tips on how to jump. And simply put was before jump cues became what they are now, whether or not it's carbon fiber or whatever, that's, that's not the point, is that the old jump cues, if anybody remembers, 
when you had to jump uh, jump the cue ball, you actually felt like you had to like muscle the, uh, your cue into the cue ball to get it to bounce into the air. And when he saw me jump a couple of times when we were uh, sparring, that's what he had noticed. And the tip that he basically gave me was, if the cue ball was frozen to the rail, like this, and I wanted to perform a stop shot with my regular cue, what would I do? Well, I'd probably try to elevate like I can, but I would, I would not hit it like I'm jumping. I would hit it like it's a shot. And so simply put, when you think about how you, your, your fundamentals, your form, your mechanics function when you shoot a shot like this, that's essentially how your jump should be. So what do I mean by that? Well, in the past, It basically looks something like this. If I wanted to jump this ball, I would look. I would normally look something like this when I when I try to jump and and how I try to hit the ball. I would really try to hammer the ball. My my fundamentals wouldn't be all that great. Sometimes I'd be able to clear the ball, and sometimes I wouldn't be able to clear the ball. But now, now that jump keys are actually so well made. If I thought this was a shot and treated it like it was a shot, I, all I'm doing is just elevating my cue, it takes me a lot less effort to be able to do that. So hopefully I'll see the difference. And forget the fact that I, I, I missed the ball. I'm not guaranteed that I'm gonna make the ball, but hopefully you can see from the angle that I'm giving you here, the, the little effort that I put into making the cue ball jump. Let's move it a little closer. Let's see if I can jump a little higher and do the same thing. Now clearly you have to put some, you know, some amount of momentum, some amount of power because there's gotta be, you can't just like, you know, um, lag speed, hit the cue ball with an elevated cue and expect it to be able to jump over an entire ball. So there, there has to be some momentum dri uh, driven into the cue ball, but it doesn't have to be like muscled um, into the cue ball. I hope that makes sense. Because all I'm doing here is I'm just stroking through the cue ball like it's a normal shot, but from this position. I barely made it over. That's why I was saying before that when the cue ball is so close or, or close enough to the object ball, that I'm more than likely probably going to try to kick at. Let's see if I can make it this time. Oh, nope, not that time. Otherwise, let's see if I can do it with the dart stroke. There we go. But hopefully you can see it's the same thing, right? Where I can actually hit it with the dark stroke with very, with very little effort. So if you're having issues with jumping, and this is a tip that I've shared with a lot of people, even some of my locals. I was actually at a, um, a Scotch Devils tournament uh, not too long ago, and I saw some uh, old buddies of mine, and I was watching them do a jump shot, and I basically told them this same exact tip. And he tried it, and he, find, and he actually realized like how much easier it was uh, for him to be able to jump. Let me show it one more time as I'm putting all these burn marks into my into my table. Line up my shot, elevate my cue, take my practice strokes, and then just fire. Whoops. <clears throat> Foul. Ugh. Try one more time. Good Lord. Maybe I'm elevating just a little too high. This is the best part about live streams is 
watching me make mistakes. Maybe I'm elevating just a little too high, so let's try a little lower. There we go. That would be the reason why. So hopefully you understand what I'm talking about, to where the less effort you put into jumping, as far as your mechanics are concerned, then you hopefully can be a little bit more accurate in actually getting the cue ball to jump. So, hope that makes sense, everybody. Oh my goodness. Look who's in the house. What's going on, Tony? You know, hopefully sooner or later, um, I'm gonna be visiting uh, Tony in Florida uh, because he does have his pool room uh, set up. And he really wants to see some straight pull. My goodness. We're definitely gonna we're definitely gonna be doing that. We're definitely gonna be doing that. Uh but let's see here. Oh, I see a lesson on banking. I don't have an issue doing that. Let me just have a quick look around again. <laughs> This is my buddy Jaybird. He's been on my channel. He wants some beard grooming tutorial. Right now, my beard is actually a mess. Uh, but a grooming tutorial would be go to your local barber and, and let them let them clean yourself up. Because <laughs> I can't I can't do it. All right, Meltdown nine hundred CC. That name sounds so familiar. Um, didn't you win a giveaway, uh, from me, uh, maybe, a, a few years back? Like, I want to say it was either a jump cue or it was a, it was a case. Your, your screen, your screen name sounds, sounds so familiar. Do you want to, you want a lesson on banking? And I can certainly do that. Problem is actually, let's do this. Um, it's, there we go. And do I have to raise the camera up a bit? I think I do. My remote. Because when I'm on this side, you can't see me. So raise the camera a little bit. And there, you should be able to see me now. Okay, so all I can do with banking is I have a few banking systems uh, that I know, but the one that I always return to that's the most accurate for me is the most accurate. And I also I've done it so much that I don't have to fully walk through it like I'm about to do here on the live stream. So say I wanted to bank the one ball into this side pocket. I'm going to physically use my cue to draw me some lines on the table to find a reference of where I need to make the one ball hit on this rail in order for it to go in. Now, you should be able to see from the camera angle that this probably looks like a pretty good darn dead bank. Right, especially even if I were to put it up like this to where we know we're two diamonds away. So if I bake it over here, one diamond closer, then it'll come over here. So actually, let's see if the measuring system already lines up with the, uh, the dead bank. So using your cue, the first line that I'm going to draw is going to be through the one ball to the rail that I'm going to make the one ball hit to where I have a perpendicular line going to it. From here, I'm going to leave the tip where it's at and just lay the butt of my cue into the pocket or at the pocket that I want to bank it to. And then actually if go grab another cue. So the next line that I'm going to draw is going to be from the one ball again, and I'm going to go, I'm going to draw a line to the pocket opposite from the one that I want to bank to. Now, hopefully camera parallax isn't coming into play, but we'll see, because I can, I can barely see what the live stream looks like from here. But hopefully what you should be able to see is where these two lines cross, which is about right here. And from this point, 
Here, I draw a line straight back to the rail, perpendicular to it again, which does happen to end up being right here at the banking point. And so what that means here is all I gotta do is make the one ball, hit this spot at the correct speed without any spin, and then I can get the ball to go in. Whoops. Now, ugh. there's a couple of variables that I have to consider as to why did I miss. I don't really, I wasn't paying close enough attention to where, did I actually hit the spot correctly? Did I strike a little too hard? Because if you hit the, if you hit the bank a little too hard, that's going to shorten the rebound angle. I don't believe I put any side spin on the cue ball, so I don't have to worry about uh, spin induced throw being transferred onto the object ball to where it could affect uh, the bank line. But let's try it again. That should be good. So if we do it again, just to prove a point, where this time if I bank a whole lot harder, I hit this a whole lot harder, I should uh, miss the bank short. Just like that. So when you're measuring this stuff out, all it's doing is giving you a reference point of where you can try to send the object ball at the correct speed with no spin. So even if I were to put the object ball a little bit closer to the rail, and this time I'm not on a dead bank, uh, dead bank line, I can still try to do the same type of measuring system just to give me an idea of where I need to bank, which is gonna be somewhere right around here. Let's see if I can make it go in. Pretty darn close, right? And that's, that's all that I can ever ask for because all of those variables that I still have to take into consideration to be able to make the darn ball. But then what about if you wanna play position? I might, have, I might know that the cue ball is going to spin off or come off this rail and I need to spin it off in a certain direction to get position on another ball. And those are going to be other variables that I have to take into account to where if, for example, I try to do the same thing. Let's put the cue ball right here. I try to do the same thing. And I come up with a reference line that looks like right about here. But I'm going to spin the cue ball off this rail. So that means I'm gonna to try to put left spin on the cue ball. That's gonna throw right spin onto the object ball, which means it should try to bank long. But I also know that if I use more force, I might be able to try to cancel it going long and try to pull it back into the pocket just so I can get the cue ball to actually move around the table. Let's see if I can do that. Again, I even shortened it just a little too much, but you can see I can flare my cue ball around. So that, that part right there is where a lot of practice um, has to come into play. But the main reason why I like this system so much is because it really doesn't matter. What you'll typically see me do is stand behind the ball, like uh, the object ball like this, and with my eyes, I'm drawing all of the lines, and I can usually pretty accurately judge where the ball has to hit on the rail. But then now I just have to make sure that my speed, any spin, or any other variables that I'm in control of are right in order to be able to, in order to be able to make the ball. And that also works the length of the table, which I'll switch camera angles uh, just to be able to show that. Let's try this again. But I can't guarantee that this is going to be 100%, but it's going to be pretty close. You'll at least get pretty close. Here's that. Let me switch back to this. And even this shot here, let's see how close I can get, because I'll try to bank it over here. So I'm, fifth, I'm trying to visualize those lines that I just uh, talked about. I think I have an idea of where I need to bank. So let's see if I can execute it. Pretty 
pretty darn close. So here's where I hit the rail. So if I manage to set up the same exact shot, this is where the ICA training system could come into play. If I did manage to set up the same exact shot, which I don't think I can, if I were to do the same exact thing, but hit the ball harder, then I would start making the ball come a little bit shorter, maybe even make it. But I'm at least getting within a ballpark of being able to make the ball. And I'm not just guessing. Like so. It's not a complete guess. It at least has some estimations uh, to where my percentage of being able to make the ball is at least a little bit higher. So I hope that helps. Hope that makes sense. All right, so there's that. Let's see what else. After straight pull, you want a push-up for each point short of 100. You know, I haven't actually been doing any push-ups uh, lately here because between work and getting the house prepared and all this other stuff, it's, 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 been, it's been hectic, and I haven't been able to try to uh, keep up with uh, working out like I would like to. But hopefully after um, everything settles down, um, I'll be able to uh, get back into uh, being a little bit uh, more fit-oriented. And yes, I do remember. Okay, I did remember correctly. Uh, Meltdown uh, 900 CC, you were one of my winners for the Predator uh, Urbane, Urbane case uh, that I gave away. So happy to see that you're back on my channel. And hopefully the uh, banking lesson that I did here uh, makes sense. Let's see here. Okay. So it looks like it might be time for some straight pull. Not going to be using the fancy um, layout that I have. This is all meant to be a little basic, so I'm just going to use a simple counter. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to do. Well, no, maybe I will. I guess I'll give a walkthrough of how I try to get through a straight pull rack. But then over the course of time, I might just start talking less and less. Just to see how well I can actually do. So anybody that's not familiar with um, straight pull, this is typically not how real, quote unquote, like, uh, two-player one-on-one straight pull is played. This is for a single player making a high run attempt of how many balls can I make without, uh, without missing or before I miss. So typically to do that, what you do is you start off with the head ball taken out of the rack. And you, I can literally place it anywhere I want on the table and I have cue ball in hand, but my objective is I have to make the ball and then drive the cue ball into the rack and open it up to start running. <clears throat> so typically you might see where ball will start here or a ball will start here and I would either cut it to the side and drive the cue ball into the head like this or I'd start it over here cut the ball into the corner drive the cue ball this way you can also have the ball back fall into the corner drive the cue ball into the rack and push it forward it just really depends but a lot of times this is a pretty classic setup here with the side of uh, hitting the side of the rack Now from here, my objective is to run all the balls, and when I get down to the last ball, I'm going to re-rack the other 14, try to make that ball, and break the rack open again. So this is actually rough. Fifteen does squeeze into the side. 
And just like in eight ball, there's problem areas that you have to solve. Now in straight pool, I don't have to shoot solids or stripes um, before I uh, get, shoot anything else. I can shoot at whatever ball I want um, because every ball is worth a point. And if you're playing a match, like with uh, in a two-player match, then you're racing to a certain number of points. So really what I'm doing as I'm talking and looking around the table, I'm trying to come up with a pattern that's going to allow me to address this particular issue. But then I also have to get the eight ball out of the way so I can shoot the four and the three into this pocket. It would probably be a good idea for me to get the six and the 11 out of the way so I can shoot the 14 into this pocket. These are the types of problems that I'm trying to solve. So I think to start off with, the 11 to the 5. The straight pool is a call ball, call pocket type of game, but typically if I'm playing an obvious shot like, like this 5 ball, I'm not going to say anything. But if I do like combo, a bank shot, a kick shot, or a carom shot, or whatever, I'll at least designate what ball and what pocket I'm trying to what pocket I'm trying to play it in. so good. The two ball freely goes and if I have the correct angle on the two ball I can kind of bump into these two here. Maybe be able to shoot the seven ball. That's actually not a, that's actually not a bad idea. So I'm going to try to use the one ball to get that type of position. So here's the shot line for the two ball. I'd like my cue ball to be somewhere close to the shot line but on this side. I don't think I got it. I did not. I'm on the wrong side. <clears throat> so, no big deal. I'm probably still going to play the two ball. Because the 12 ball freely goes here as well. So, if I get the correct position on the 12 ball, I can still do the, I can still do the same thing. Break into that cluster and then have the 13 ball or maybe the 7 ball as a backup shot. <clears throat> and then now there's still this. The 6, the six ball blocking I might have to use the seven ball to break the six out. I'm just trying to think about that for a second. Twelve ball right now is a more difficult shot, but I might be able to come two rails around and bump into this. That might work. And take a more difficult shot that might uh, have some better rewards to take. Go ahead and try that. Okay, so I solved the problem, but then I created another one. I don't really have a decent shot. 14 ball goes in the corner, but it's a little close, so that's hard, that's hard to judge. Cutting the 7 over here is going to be hard to judge. Cutting the 7 over here is hard to judge. And I might be able to cut the 2 ball from here. Now I gotta decide which is gonna be easier for me to do, to shoot this close 14 ball and risk double hitting the two ball, or shooting a very difficult uh, cut shot on the two ball. If I cut the two ball in successfully, I know my cue ball is gonna go here and come out, so I'll have shots available. <clears throat> and I think that's what I'm going to try. I'm gonna elect for the two ball. Undercut the ball. So, <clears throat> slow start, scoring only, scoring only six points. Oh, 
rack everything up and start back over. Okay, you can see we got a little bit of a different result. Got a lot of balls out in the open, but nice little cluster that I have to deal with. But you also see that I don't have any real good candidates for a break ball to go into the next rack. So I might have to manufacture one. Unless I decide to leave this eight ball here for the side pocket, because like right now, if, 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 if all the balls were racked, this is what I would do. I'd shoot the eight into the side and try to drive the cue ball into the rack like this even from this position. But as it stands right now, the eight ball is kind of my easiest shot to where I can get control of the table. I have a shot here clearly, um, but I think that shot's a little bit more difficult than shooting the eight in the side. I'm actually gonna try to shoot the eight in the side. And I'd like my cue ball to go this way so I can hit the rail and hit this cluster from behind. And then maybe I'll have the 11 and the five as backup shots. How that works. Or I can just run right into the cluster. Now I kind of manufactured a, a break ball. The six ball is a little low, but it would contact the, the fourth and fifth row of the rack. So that might be okay. The shot I really have right now is to shoot the 10 ball. I gotta figure out what my next move is gonna be. Because I'm kind of straight in on this 10 ball. I think I can play positions with a 3 in the side if I just roll the ball in. So I'm in a pretty good position now to really try to come up with some planning on what the heck do I want to do. So the 7 ball kind of blocks a couple of things, so that means I can use the 14 ball to get position on the 7 to go here. And once I do that, it opens this pocket up for both the 2 and the 6. Don't really have anything to worry about with these two. But I think we're pretty good. Go ahead and try to take care of these. I think is where I'm going to address my attention to, starting with the 13 ball. <clears throat> well, I don't like that I got a little flat on the 9 ball. I hit that a little firm so I can get on the 14. Now I can try to get on the 7. Okay, so here's where I really got to start putting in some real thinking as to how I'm going to end this. I can decide. 
decide that my sixth ball is going to be my next break ball. So how am I going to pull off my transitions here? Looks like I should cut this in, maybe spin two reels out so that way I can get on one of these two. You think about when you think about normal pool, and th and this is the eight ball. How would you like to be? Probably as straight in as possible, right? But in a straight pool, that's not going to do you anything, right? If I land straight in on this six ball, all I can do is follow after it, draw straight back, or stop the cue ball. So what good is that going to do me when I have to break the rack open again? That's why I'm going to want to try to land somewhere on this side of the shot line. So I can back cut the ball in and drive the cue ball back into the rack. So it's very important that I come up with some sort of end pattern using these last three balls and make sure that my cue ball lands somewhere over here. I think the way I'm gonna to try to do that is play the five, come over here for the four, shoot the four in so I can shoot the cue over here and kind of drag my cue ball side of the, in the four ball to where I have to follow forward a little bit. I don't want to follow forward too much. I might actually have to go to the rail. Yeah, I think I have to go to the rail and, and, and come back out. come out far enough because now my cue ball is going to be coming way out here and i got to just manage my uh, cue ball control. There we go. Kind of like that. So now you can see that if I cut the six in, my cue ball automatically goes into this area of the rack. Hopefully getting a, a decent knocking loose a couple of balls to try to do some secondary shots. Secondary break shots. But, second attempt, 14 points. So now that I've done all that, I must uh, stop talking and try to focus. Because all I have to do now is rinse and repeat the process.
So in this particular scenario, I was trying to get a little flat on this ball. That way I can use this ball to go into the corner and then come two rails around. Now I'm at an angle where my cue ball goes away. So it would be more difficult for me to go up and come back down than for me to be able to maybe use this ball and try to land over here with this uh, pocket here. But I don't want to be on the rail because if I'm on the rail, and all I can do is roll the ball in. When you look at the 15 ball, I need to be on this side. So I want to be able to like stun the ball or maybe slightly draw the ball. So I got to make sure I'm not on the rail. And I don't want to over roll the ball to where my cue ball automatically goes this way as well. This is why I like straight pulls so much because this the, these last three balls, the position is very critical. style because you've all you've already seen me do uh, plenty of uh, side rack break shots because I mean had I made that ball I mean I was doing the, basically the same shot that got me into the second rack you know coming into coming into these two balls let me try this one this one's a little difficult to judge <clears throat> because I'm gonna shoot this in it looks like my cue ball should hit the 13 ball and I'm gonna push my cue ball forward with top spin and then use left spin to come through rails around and hopefully not hit anything and land somewhere near the middle of the table. <clears throat> Whoops, you can see that didn't work out so well.
But I can try to play the 6 in the side. I'm going to go off the 11. I don't have to call off the 11. I just say 6 in the side. Okay, big mess that I got to deal with here. Best bet is going to either be shooting the 13 into the corner and driving my cue ball this way, or shooting the one ball into this corner and making sure that I have an angle to drive my cue ball that way. I can even use the three ball if I have the, uh, the right cut angle to go into the side rail and come out like this. But I'm kind of in a good position to use the 15 ball right now to try to get over here to the 13 ball. I think that's what I'm going to try to do. Now the only problem about doing something like this, it would be really great if there was a ball right here. Because I can shoot this in freely, drive the cue ball into the rack, and have a pretty good assurance that if I can't get a shot out of these balls, I'll have this ball that I can shoot at. That's referred to as an insurance shot, or as Tony likes to call it, a Geico. I'm going to shoot the 13 in, man, I can make it run into the 10, which is going to run into the 2 and free up the 12, the 2 might come out a little here, what I don't want to do is push forward, because I can hit the 10 and then hit the 4, and then my cue ball goes out like this, and I don't have anything, I think I have to kind of stun into this, and we just saw me miss a, miss a fairly simple shot in the side pocket, shooting like this. There we go. Good result. Might use this as a break ball. <clears throat> Checking what all of my options are before I make a decision. taking a lot of time right now because I'm really trying to figure out how I'm going to run the rest of these balls. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
you're still watching, you have to let me know what do you think of that end pattern. Was there a better one, or did I did I pick a good one? Whew. Or anybody for that matter. You know, because I'll go back and read the live chat um, later on. Anybody see a better end pattern than, than what I did? Oh. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. My first shot was to shoot the one ball into the corner and come over here. Then I figured, why not get rid of a, a ball that's on the rail? Oh, well. <clears throat> so that was a 15. Okay. So I have no problem doing that uh, some more. But if there's something else uh, somebody would like to see, feel free to let me know. As I go through the chats. We had lots of discussions about tips. I actually have a Zan uh, tip on um, a Jacoby uh, that I have. I don't have any complaints about that tip because I see a lot of mentions about the, the Zan tip. Well, I can certainly answer this from Goba44. So like, do I have any plans for my uh, new house um, for my studio? Well, the, the new house has to have a room big enough to fit a nine foot table um, in it, which roughly equates to about like a 19 by 19 uh, type of room or 20 by 20. Uh, so that way there's ample room on the sides that if I were to shoot a rail shot, I don't have to worry about the back of my queue um, running into a wall. Um, and then, um, you know, and, and if it's big enough as well to like maybe have a, a little bit of furniture um, in it, right? You know, like some chairs or, you know, pl uh, places for people to sit. Um, and it's still going to be just a matter of like, the, the um what the walls are going to look like and how high the ceiling um is of the room so that way i can try to have an aerial view um of the table you know so like i have visions of of what i want because like everything that i have in here is relatively perfect for the types of views uh, that i have i have the main view i have a side view i do have an aerial view but i'm not gonna bother turning on my uh, gopro tonight um and at one point in time, if I wasn't going to move, I was thinking about putting another camera in here and kind of give you a diagonal view, uh, like from a from a corner pocket perspective uh, type of view, and then figure out how to get the the camera views to basically uh, toggle uh, from time to time to where you go from having this view to this view to the next view and so on and so on and so forth. And it would just like random or it would sequentially rotate 
um, everything uh, on on uh, on some sort on some on some sort of timer. That's at least what I'm planning on trying to get. Oh, you're asking me um, what's the blue picture uh, behind me, which is this. So uh, let's see, how do I do this? So there's multiple ones, but this one that you can currently see here is a blueprint of a chalk holder. I actually got this, um, I won this in a uh, contest where I had to find an Easter egg that was in a video and you can't see it, but above it is another one that shows the blueprint for a bridge. And then over on the other side is uh, a blueprint for a table and a blueprint for a triangle, uh, for a uh, triangle rack. <clears throat> okay, so I don't really see any other types of suggestions other than more straight pull, which I'm happy to oblige uh, for that. Oh, there we go. Tony's room is 19 by 21, and uh, he's got a nine foot table um, in there. So there you go. That, like that's pretty much something that um, I'm going to be looking for um, as well. And you know, it would be nice if the ceiling is high enough uh, because I would also like to have um, a perimeter light uh, because what I currently have right now, I mean, it, it's what I have right now is workable. Let's see if I can get it to where you can see them. All right. So there's one. There's one light that this is a four foot light that's on the foot rail. And yeah, so you can't see it. Uh, let me try this. But on the head rail is the same is the same four foot light, and on the side rails is um, a four foot light um, as well. So let me set this back. Oops. And let me go here. And if I can, I and there. So there's the there's the other um, four foot light that you can see here. So I've got four four foot lights around my table and I'd rather would just have one perimeter light uh, that goes completely around the table. The only reason why I don't have a perimeter light in here right now is because of my garage door. Uh, but I do have my garage door opener set to where I can open the garage up enough to where it does not hit the light that's on the that's on the far side rail. I could I could have basically done the same thing uh, with the uh, the perimeter light um, as well. But that's at least what I would like to have um, in the uh, in the next house. Let's switch this back and then go back to here. So yeah, um, Matt Burroughs, the answer is yes. I do plan on going to more tournaments because I'm going to be not playing in the APA um, anymore uh, once I'm uh, once I'm uh, moved out. So the the only league I'm going to be playing um, is going to be a, nine, a BCA nine ball league um, at Skinny Bob's in Round Rock. Um, and that's only going to be one time, uh, one day a week. So that means I have six days out of the week to hopefully start producing more content for uh, Facebook and YouTube and all my other social media platforms, which also does open up the weekends more for me uh, to be able to participate in more tournaments. Uh, so I am, I am looking forward um, into that. But yeah, let's go ahead and try to do a couple more racks of straight pulls since I don't see any other suggestions. So here we go. No talking uh, during this one now that um, hopefully everybody should have, have an idea of what it is I'm trying to do. So I try to focus a little bit more.
Ideally, this would have been my break ball, but now I've got to use it to break, break some clusters.
Definitely not a fan of playing position for a break shot like that. I would have liked to have had a thicker hit so I can make you play one rail or possibly two rails to get on that break ball like that. That wasn't, <laughs> that was not the greatest of end patterns, but I made it work. Ideally, what I really wanted was to get uh, a little flat on the ball that I had over here, so that way I can shoot it and roll down to the last ball that I used and just go straight across into the side pocket and roll my cue ball to about right there. That's ideally what I was trying to do. I just didn't get it. difficult things about breaking into the next rack is how much power to actually use. Sometimes I've tried to just waylay into it, but then I get disastrous results. And then sometimes I try to finesse my way into it, and I get decent results. And then sometimes I get this result. Sometimes I waylay into it, and I get fantastic results. A lot of times my results are just not consistent. Which is another frustrating aspect about this game that I like a lot. to playing the combo. The combo is really not that bad. My benefit would be is if I if I land the combo, the 10 ball will hit the rail and then hopefully roll somewhere right here for a break ball. That could be a thing. Or I can use the 12 in the side and try to part these two balls. I think that's what I'm going to end up trying to do. We've already got a nine ball uh, as a break ball. So I don't really have to worry about anything. So that's helpful. Are you kidding me? Ah, goodness gracious, everything was solved uh, after that. Is that 14 uh, plus 6? It's a 20. 
Well, normally I have a program that I would be entering these scores in so that way it can tell me what my average is, but I do believe my average is been close to 14. And I had that bad run at the very beginning where I think I got a six. I think everything after that has been in the second half.
Ubisoft. I would have definitely liked to be nice and flat on that ball, so all I have to do is just play a stop shot because going to the rail and coming back up, I run a risk of landing just a little too short on that nine ball. And then, of course, I run the risk of overhitting it and landing straight in for the nine ball in this corner and not having a decent break angle. Well, not exactly the result I was looking for. Oh, darn it. That's disgusting. All right, we have to play the thirteen in the corner.
Anybody ever play the game Operation? <laughs> what this next shot's going to feel like. It's so hard not to, not to double hit the, the cue ball. And I really I didn't know whether or not to try to play a position for the two because the three blocks blocks my path for the eight and the ten ball is frozen to the eight, so I can't shoot it. Uh, let's see, six, seven, that means I dropped eight. So that's what, 22? Right, one more, and I'll check on the chat again. I tell you what, on this one here, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna blast the rack. Pretty good result. <laughs> A couple of issues I gotta deal with. I gotta get the six out of the way for the thirteen, or vice versa. And I gotta get the nine and the one um, out of the way. Which I'm actually in a position right now to do. Okay, so no problem solved. Are you serious? Yep. I don't have a shot. Oh, darn it. That's what I get for not looking around long enough. I don't have a decent shot anywhere. I mean, cut the 11. I didn't even cut the 2, but the 2 ball is like my best break ball, so I don't really want to do that. Maybe I can. I can also cut the 4. Between the four and the eleven, I think the four ball is the best shot. Yep. All right. Still got to deal with that. The combo is okay, and I can also try to land like near this window here and cut the six in. I, I do have that as options. Three ball actually makes for a pretty good ball to break them open. I think I'm actually going to try to work my way towards that three ball. I think it's going to take me two shots to get there. 12-12-9-3. Or 12-5-3. I tied up another ball.
overcut the ball. 13's next. This is probably my key ball uh, to the two ball. <clears throat> um, I didn't start the score over. So that means on that one, I only scored, I only scored a seven. Ugh. And I just realized every time I step out there, I for keep I keep forgetting to turn on my um, shotgun microphone that's at the that's under uh, that's right beside the the main camera. Are y'all still able to hear me okay out there? It, it probably is really echoey um, with the shotgun microphone not uh, not being on. Uh, Rocco, where are you sending your messages? Or I believe the email address. Is supposed to be support at jflowersqs.com. Or, di or did you try or did you try just um, using the uh, contact us that's on the um, or did you try using the contact us that's on their actual website? Voicemail? They have a phone number? Let me look. Oh, okay. So, well, is that WhatsApp? I think that's, I think that's a WhatsApp um, icon. I would, I would definitely recommend um, emailing them rather rather than the telephone um, approach but let me double check something Give me just a second. This will be for anybody that wants to. Um... Attempt to, to contact them. Yeah, OK. So I would definitely recommend. You send an email to here with your questions. Um, at least in my experience, before I was even before I was even a sponsored player, uh, their email uh, was much more responsive. I'm I'm not all too familiar with phone support, uh, so I can't really uh, testify to any of that. But at least uh, their email support um, has been pretty good. Maybe that'll help you out. Okay, so how long have I been streaming? Only two hours. Well, I mean I'm not done. It's my this is the last one I'm doing in this house. So it's like I want to. Definitely make it uh, worthwhile. All right, so let's close that and close that. And all right, let's see how everybody's doing. Anybody have any questions they'd like me to answer? Or any requests they would uh, like me to do um, while I'm on stream? Okay, so there's the last question that I answered. Um, let's see, where's that answer? Where's that statement? I definitely want to highlight this. Big Twill, if you're still here and you've never played straight pool, I would highly recommend that you give it a try. Um, the best part about playing straight pool in regards to doing high run attempts um, is you're, you are just shooting shots over and over and over and over. The caveat is, is that you're not banking a ball very often. You're not kicking at a ball uh, very often. And you're not jumping a ball uh, very often. So, but you're at least shooting... Uh, 
a whole bunch of different kind of shots. You're breaking into clusters a whole uh, uh, a bunch of different ways. Um, so it's it's the game that I love to practice more. Like I I played straight pool like a long time ago in my um, early teens and um, or late teens and early twenties, but I never really had the appreciation for the game like I do now uh, because now that I'm focused on doing a high run attempt, I see. I see more clearly how difficult the game actually is to be able to string together a really good high run. Um, in my opinion, I think it's much harder to run 42 balls, which is three racks of straight pull without missing. That is harder to do than breaking and running three racks of nine ball where the nine, where the one ball is on the spot and you're using a template rack. Now, if I don't, if I use a triangle rack, then it might, it might be relatively equal, right? Because at least with a template rack, I'm guaranteed the wing ball to go in. I, I'm also a high probability of knowing where all balls are going to go um, after the break with the way that I break um, nine ball with one on the spot um, in a template rack. But I, I have that opinion mainly because whether it's eight ball or nine ball or even 10 ball, the biggest difference between stringing racks together in eight, nine, or 10 versus stringing racks together in straight pool is that in eight, nine, and 10, there's what I would call a reset, right? Because after you make the money ball, you're going to reset the entire rack and re-break it open to where if you're using a template rack, you can have a high probability of, you know, roughly creating the same layouts, uh, maybe uh, create the same trend. And I say maybe maybe create the same transitions, but in straight pull, there is no reset, right? You have to be able to have a decent break ball. You have to be able to play your end pattern so good to land on that good angle on the break ball so that you can go into the next rack. By that, by that uh, rule alone, that's why I think stringing racks together in straight pull is much harder than stringing racks together in eight ball, nine ball, and 10 ball. Eight ball, nine ball, and 10 ball have their difficulties in stringing racks together. That's apparently there. I just think it's more difficult to string consecutive racks of straight pull together than it is uh, the other ones. Love this question here. Global 44, the answer is absolutely yes. Do I think straight pull helps uh, both uh, eight ball and nine ball games? It definitely helps a lot in the eight in the eight ball game because it's roughly the same thing, meaning that the eight ball is your break ball, right? The ball that you're gonna the ball that you're gonna get on last, and you're and you're really trying to figure out how to build a pattern of running stripes or running solids in such a way to where it's easier to land roughly straight in on that eight ball. So when you're when you think about how you're trying to get you're, you're trying to determine what your end pattern is to be on the break ball, you're going to run a very similar pattern to where you're going to, this is what Tony Robles loves to say, you minimize your cue ball movement to maximize your run out potential. Now in nine ball, that is clearly a little bit different because a lot of layouts that are going to be in nine ball would require you to move your cue ball around, playing two rail positions for shape, playing three rail positions for shapes, going up and down the table. Sometimes there's a layout in nine ball though, where you can minimize your cue ball movement, right? Because all the balls just happen to be wired up uh, next to each other. But playing straight pull has helped me a lot in both games uh, to where every once in a while I have to shoot a hard difficult shot. Every once in a while in straight pull, I have to do what I, a nine ball transitional move going from one ball to the next. But a lot of times I only have to do very, uh, or Hopefully, as you saw through some of the racks that I've played tonight, my cue ball movement is relatively small uh, once I get uh, uh, decent in line. And when I get a good uh, end pattern, my cue ball movement is really small and I land on the break ball just fine. Ali Jafari, what do you mean by best? I, I always love seeing questions like this now. The more, the more that I've been... Um, you know, as, as an influencer um, on social media for, for pool, what, what, does, what does best mean uh, to you? Because best to you is not gonna be best to me. All right, so I really have to, I really have, to have, have you answer that question. What do you mean by best for a, th for a thousand bucks? 
because, yeah, what the heck does that mean? Performance and consistency. What does that really mean? Do you really think that a $500 pool, or do you really think that a $1,000 queue will significantly outperform and have more consistency than, say, a $500 queue or a $600 queue or, heck, even a $300 queue? In some, I would say, rare instances, there might be a small beneficial factor in paying for higher value because I do believe that. I do believe that higher value items sometimes yield better results on uh, certain types of things that you're certain outcomes that you're that you're trying to achieve. When it comes to when it comes to pool equipment, when it comes to pool equipment, it's it's ve it's very very minor. It's very very minor. But I, I would venture to say that if you're dead set on spending a thousand dollars on a queue. All I can say is regardless of the amount that you want to spend, it's really just a matter of, is it the queue that you want? Because no matter what, there is a possibility that you're going to spend $1,000 on a queue and you're going to go, this queue is garbage. I just wasted my money. And then there's also a possibility that you can spend $1,000 on a queue and go, I love this queue. But you know what? Those two scenarios that I just described, you can, can have the same effect if you buy a $300 queue, $400 queue, $500 queue. It really just depends. What you're going to get out of the money that you put into a queue is how the queue looks. The amount of inlays, the, 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 you know, the, the, the customization, the way the queue looks. That's where a lot of, that's where a lot of the money is going to go into, while the remainder of the money goes into the performance of the queue. The, uh, the consistency part, that's really just going to be more on you um, as, as far as I'm concerned. So I hope that helps uh, because there's no real good way to answer uh, that, uh, that question as to what is supposed to be the best. Because if you're asking that question, let me just ask you this. Who is the number one player in the world? Right? I think we can say right now it's Joshua Filler. Right? I think he has the, the highest Fargo um, in the world. What cue does he shoot with? Issues with predator cues. So does that make predator cues the best? Well, if the answer is going to be yes, then how come everybody else? There's a lot of people that do use predator cues. There's a lot of people that use predator cues. There's a lot of other pros that don't use predator cues. Like Jason Shaw, for example. He is recently sponsored by J Flower Cues. And actually, I think the cue that he uses, let me see here. If I'm not mistaken, I can find the cue that he's using. I believe, I believe it's this one. And let me make sure I provide my affiliate code with it. So if you want to have like the same cue that Jason Shaw shoots with, I, I believe it's this. I I might be wrong, but I believe it's this one. And if I'm wrong, I, I would have to go look at his um, social media uh, to find out. But I do believe it's this one. The cue that I'm shooting with right now that I'm playing straight pull with is, oh yeah, I had it right. It's the JF2020. Thank you, Uworski. One that I'm shooting with right now is this one. And the one that I'm shooting with costs $600 before taxes and before shipping and handling. And the one that Jason Shaw uses is $500 before, ship, uh, before taxes and before shipping and handling. I mean, if you want to spend $1,000 on a queue, go for it. If you, especially if you can afford it. 
I'm just going to say, make sure it's the one that you want. Okay, so uh, this will be uh, the last I'm going to talk about this topic because I, 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 I do like the question. Is $1,000 Sneaky Pete better than an inlaid queue? Again, what does better mean? Like when, you, when you're asking that question. Because last I heard, a Sneaky Pete looks like a pool hall's house queue. It, it, it looks like a, it, a Sneaky Pete looks like a one-piece house queue. So you want to spend $1,000 on a queue that looks like you can just pull off the wall uh, at any generic pool hall, or would you rather pull, uh, spend $1,000 on a queue that has like, you know, intricate inlays or, you know, or some artwork or, or whatever, right? So it, it really comes down to how much of a personal preference um, it is on what it is that you're trying to find and how the queue represents you. Because I've said it before in an older video of mine to where, what, what, what I've generally seen is that people will buy whatever queue that they want. And what ends up happening is that if they walk into their local pool hall and they see somebody else with their queue, then that almost makes them want to go buy another queue because they want to have the only queue in existence in, you know, in their pool hall because they want to be unique. They want to be able to, they want to be able to stand out. That's usually from my experience, what I've seen that drives them to spend more money on a pool queue on top of making sure that it has the correct tip, it has the shaft that they want, it has the right taper or it's the right length, you know, the small customizations to make it to be the queue that they want to have. So I hope that makes sense. All right, I tell you what, folks, um, I'm going to go ahead and do a few more tries um, in straight pool. Um, and then I think I'm going to go ahead and call it a night. Um, I got a, I got a couple more things that I got to wrap up uh, with regards to getting my house cleaned um, and then actually uh, listing it on the market. But what I can do real quick. There we go. To show everybody. Like everything is gone. That tool chest, I'm going to be taking that tool chest out. I used to have a lot of electronics here on this table. And there was a lot where those boxes are um, was a lot of electronics, like my other cameras that I would have, my forehead camera and stuff. But these are the things, and you can see here's the J Flowers website. <laughs> these are the things that I'm leaving in this, in this garage at the moment. That shelf back there used to have a lot of stuff on all the different shelves. But this is how this room is staying to be staged so that any potential buyer um, can come in here and look at it. All these boxes that you see on this chair, these are all um, of what my cables, my microphones and everything else they go. You can see the, you can see the shotgun microphone there in the uh, lower right hand corner that I keep forgetting to turn on when I, when I step out here. But this is what my room looks like. As it remains, as it remains, quote unquote, staged for any potential buyer to come in here and look. And then I have this workbench uh, that's over here that still has my that still has my Q lathe. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, leave this in here um, as well. And then, when any potential buyer reaches the closing stage of purchasing purchasing the house, then I gotta get everything out of here. <laughs> So let's go back to this and let's try a few more attempts. And this time I will remember to turn the shotgun microphone on. So this will be my last few set of attempts. And then I will be bidding y'all farewell until I get my next house set up. But when I say that, there might be times where I might possibly be able to make it out to like my local uh, local pool, like Skinny Bob's or something, and maybe record something there um, because I can still take my laptop and some webcams or I actually have camcorders and stuff to where I can set them up around a table and maybe uh, shoot some videos and, and do something. But it'll just have to, it'll just have to depend.
No decent break ball. Don't really mind shooting this combo right now. Even though I have the five ball and even the two ball are easier shots. I really want to shoot this combo though. Maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. Especially if I can work my way into a position to be able to do that. Okay, so now I need to look at trying to manufacture a break ball somehow. Like that. Just turn the 10 ball into a break ball. definitely start trying to figure out how I'm going to get on that 10 ball. I definitely got to move this 14 ball out of the way for the 13 or move the 8 ball out of the way for the 13. And then that way when I get these two balls gone, the one ball can go. to move that ball that much. I kind of wanted to just gently bump into it. Not like this. And that's why. Oh well. Uh, so that's what? Two, five, six, seven. That was an eight. Maybe I shouldn't have bumped into that ball at all because I, I did have that option. I was trying to just bump into it so I can shoot it into that corner, but I tried, but not with a not with a back cut angle like that. And I should have just put a little bit more due diligence into actually shooting that ball. Right, let's try something a little different. Mix it up a bit. This is like the Thorsten Holman way of breaking. He'll usually 
power draw the ball back here and then it'll spin back over towards the middle of the table. to get straight in. Now my cue ball is going to run into those balls. All right, let's see here. Let's just try to run into the nine ball. Oh, never mind. Just took away a really good key ball. <laughs> that was not supposed to be a stop shot. I feel like I'm playing a recovery shot after a recovery shot after a recovery shot. It's not ideal. Put that one too soft. But I have an end pattern. Let's see if I can do it. Oh. <laughs> Almost even missed that one. That's kind of that's kind of what I wanted to do uh, with that. I think, what did I do? I missed when I had what five left on the table. That was a ten. Eesh. No real great shot except for shooting off probably the best break ball. I mean, there are other break balls on the table.
that's so soft. Did not mean to do that. I was trying to get on the nine ball. Undercut the ball. Oh. Six, seven, that's an eight. So now, now I can tell my average is going down. I haven't gotten into the second rack uh, for a bit. It's brutal. I wasn't sure if I was going to run into that 14 ball so I can disturb this. Let's play the 14. Or not. <laughs> oh man, this is getting rough.
Man, a bunch of small windows I have to land in. Ah, all right. straight. But I'm always thankful I can get to the end of the rack. But we can clearly see where my mistake was. I got bad position on my key ball because I wanted to be flat. Maybe I shouldn't have gone to the rail. That's probably where my mistake was, was going, was going to the rail. I like to do is just come back here like this. I'm going to try to call the one ball into the cross side pocket. Oh, like that. <laughs> you saw that I was pretty close to making it. It's usually a pretty good ball to make. Let me try demonstrating it from a better angle. If you're ever playing straight pull, going for high run attempts, and you end up in positions like this, whether it's on this side or on this side, call the corn ball in the cross side pocket. You basically clip the ball with, I like to use outside spin so I can spin my cue ball three rails around. See? Right. <laughs> with the exception of that, <laughs> that usually does that usually doesn't happen. But the ball, but the ball will go. And it's actually, it's actually a pretty high percent chance 
I can try demonstrating it from the other side. But for whatever reason, if you don't have position on your, or if you don't break the rack, you end up on something like this. So now in this case here, I'll call the 15 ball in the cross side pocket with left spin. Uh, pretty high percent chance. Not a hundred percent, but pretty high percent. All right, I think I'm gonna try to make I'm gonna make this my last attempt. I'm gonna try to put forth a good effort here. I've been trying all night. Haven't been able to get into the third rack. soft. Yeah, I think I did. I don't think I can get the position that I wanted to get going from the 11 to the 13. Uh, what are my alternatives? too soft. But I can still end up with a decent break angle. And actually that's still just the one, 14.
Oof. Bang! Okay, let's see here. As much as I like this eight ball as a break ball, I might have to use it to move that nine. Unless I can find another ball to go into the side pocket off the nine, like maybe the 10, maybe. Can't use the ten now. Nine ball ends up somewhere over here. I can use the seven to. If I get the nine ball somewhere up here. I can use the seven to transition back down table. I think that's probably the better choice. I think I'm in position to attack. Okay, here we go. Five on the side.
The second round, this is a lot thinner uh, than I would like it to be. Does anybody have a suggestion on how they would have solved that nine ball quicker? Leave a comment in the chat so I can look at it later. Ooh, this is a lot thinner than I would like it to be. And I overcut the ball. <laughs> oh, well, 28. I at least got my final attempt to be into the, into the third rack. All right. Well, I hope everybody was able to enjoy that. Uh, <clears throat> Does anybody have any topics they'd like to discuss um, before I uh, close the stream out? Let's see, I'm going to look through the chat. Let's see here. Bang time pool, you're going to ask what uh, pocket size am I going to end it with? Most likely the same thing. I'll probably just still stick with um, four and a half uh, corner pockets with uh, five inch uh, side pockets, which is called Pro Cut. Um, I don't. It's still one of those things to where it's like, you know, I wanted to eventually shim these pockets to be a little bit smaller, but then I got the advice of not doing that until after I run 100 balls. And considering that. If I do um, upgrade the size um, of the table, um, that's going to increase um, a level of difficulty. And it might make things a little bit easier uh, because that way I don't have, I can probably hit the, the rack a little bit harder. Um, and with the real estate, spread the balls out a little bit more to where I'll have less clusters. So it might make it a little bit easier when I play on a nine foot table versus an eight foot table. Not not entirely sure. We'll have to find out um, in the long run. But then, you know, after that, then I'm, you know, if I do that, then I might consider maybe shimming my pockets on my nine foot table to be a little bit smaller. Not entirely sure, though. Let's see. Rune Moss 3. Random question. What do you use to clean your carbon fiber shafts? Um, a microfiber cloth. Nothing, really. Um, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with using like, um, alcohol wipes, uh, cause there, it, it really doesn't get all that dirty and not, nothing that just a microfiber cloth can, uh, can, can clean. 
Um, it's it's much easier to keep a carbon fiber shaft clean than a uh, wooden uh, wooden shaft. Uh, Mana blades, of course. If we happen to see each other in real life, um, I'm happy to play. I've got no I've got no issues with that. <laughs> if I could play one game for the rest of my life, what would it be? Man, that's a tough one. That's really a tough one. You know what? I I, I definitely uh, I definitely would have to say that it would probably have to be straight pool. Um, I've made efforts before on like how many racks can I break and run in nine ball, um, which I think the most I've ever done. And I think I have it on a live stream without taking ball in hand. I think it's like five or six. Um, I don't know what I've done. Uh, I don't know what I've done for 10 ball. I think I might've done maybe a two or a three pack um, in 10 ball. So it's one of those to where it's like, well, if I were to choose one of those games, like what would be the goal that I would do for social media? Like, do I want to try to break and run 10 racks of nine or what, um, what did Justin Bergman do um, uh, where he broke and ran like 14 or 15 racks of nine ball on, a, I believe it was on a seven foot table, wasn't it? Or he did something where he broke and ran like that many racks uh, with a template rack, but he was, he was soft breaking, getting consistent spreads. And then randomly, he would like hit the rack hard and still get a good spread uh, and then still be able to run out. Like that would be a goal that I would want to attempt for like, you know, social media or something. But when, pu when push comes to shove, it would, it would probably, it would probably have to be straight pull. It would probably have to be straight pull. Uh, Pablo uh, Delia, um, I'm about to shut the stream off for the night, so I won't be able to show you this um, right now. Uh, but if memory serves correctly, just go take a look at one of my oldest pool videos that I've ever done uh, where I cover the fundamentals um, of the game. If you look on my channel, it's one of my oldest. Um, if you look at my pool lessons playlist, it should be the oldest video um, in that playlist. And I do believe I cover the, uh, I do cover the grip hand, whether you're right-handed or left-handed. Um, that should be able to shed some light on that. That's no more of a true statement than I've ever heard, um, Aaron. Sometimes you ride the struggle bus. Other times you drive it. Absolutely. Sometimes they'll be in here. I've, I've actually had some practice sessions where I don't have the camera running. I just come in here and start playing. And I'll string together like some consistent 30s and 40s. And then I'll have some nights, uh, some practice sessions where I'll come in here and I won't even get out of the first rack. For like you know 10 tries in a row or something that's the that's the wonderful roller coaster ride of of this game is all the ups and downs mike 104 what's the most action that i've ever played for if memory serves correctly i think i did a race to nine for i think it was 300 and I, I think I think that's the I think that's the most uh, that that I've ever played for. It's not the most amount of money that I've ever won uh, won gambling. Um, and actually, when uh, that particular set that I'm talking about, um, I ended up if I remember this was like years ago too, because I don't really gamble all that much. Especially I don't gamble that high um, anymore. If I if I gamble nowadays, it might be five dollars a rack, ten dollars a rack, or you know, and the and the most I'll put up is like a hundred or two hundred bucks. But I have to. I won't lose, I won't play in a game where I lose it all at once. So if I'm going to lose like a hundred dollars, if I'm set to lose a hundred dollars, I'd want to play for like maybe 10 bucks a game or maybe a race to five for 25 bucks. That gives me four barrels uh, to be able to fight, you know, so, something like that. But I, the most I've ever played for um, in a set is I, if I remember, if I remember correctly is race to nine for 300 and I ended up breaking even. Uh, the night that I did that, but that was many, many years ago, many, many years ago.
Ah, see, there we go. So Justin Bergman, he ran 18 racks. It was one on the spot template soft breaking on a bar box. All right. So if I were to dedicate uh, to playing uh, nine ball for for social for like social media or even for my own for my own career per se to where I start participating in, uh, you know, like matchroom events and nine ball or whatever, it would be to have like some sort of goal like that. I would want to beat that uh, uh, would be the, would be the goal. So like right now, I'm certainly not trying to beat uh jason shaw's uh 714 or even willie moscone's uh what was it 586 or something and then john schmidt's got about like 600 plus i'm trying to score my first hundred my first century and the best i've ever i've been able to do is like 88 uh, and i have that on i have that recorded on on my channel and you know by golly if i can just manage to get back up there and get the last 12 balls i, I will have that goal uh finally accomplished Let's see here. Here's one of my locals. How's it going, Duggar? Good to see you, man. Evans, haven't seen you in, in quite a long time. Hope everything's uh, going well for you. Holy crap. Are you serious? Keith McCready? Or I should say Grady Seasons. <laughs> you ran 34 uh, racks on a bar box uh, before? Golly. That had that had to have been um, without a template rack, though, right? Was it Was it a triangle rack back in those days? And it was, geez, that's impressive. Even even for triangle racking. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, what is organization? The original PZ thirty hacker. <laughs> I really do appreciate the compliment. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. I see everybody's just having general conversations and whatnot. You know, I want to thank everybody uh, for being here uh, with me tonight. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is most likely going to be my final live stream in this garage um, for now. Um, I'm hoping to wrap up the last bit of cleaning that I have to do for my house and have it on the market um, by the end of this week. Um, don't know how long it's going to take to sell. You know, I would hopefully estimate a month at the most, hopefully, you know, or, you know, sooner, maybe. <laughs> um, and then while the house is on the market, um, that's when I'll be shopping around, um, in the Georgetown round rock area, uh, for the, uh, for the next, uh, potential house. Um, you know, it, Give or take a month or two, hopefully, hopefully not more. Um, and then we'll have to see um, what it's going to take for me to be able to set up the new studio. Um, and, you know, am I going to be able to, I should be able to hopefully reutilize all my equipment here. Uh, but depending upon uh, what, what the, the, the room and what I'm going to have to work with, I may upgrade everything. Um, I might upgrade the microphones and, you know, and, and just, I don't know what I'm going to do. It, it really just depends on when I actually get there. But hopefully it won't be too long. Best case scenario that uh, that I can do, or not best case scenario, but what I could also potentially do is that um, from time to time, maybe I can just go down to my local pool hall and just record maybe some straight pull attempts on a nine foot table or re record some break and runs or something and maybe just do some like voiceover commentary um, or something in the meantime while I'm waiting to set up my new studio. Uh, but... As I'm setting up the new studio, I can definitely like try to, you know, get some pictures or maybe some short little videos of the new studio as I'm building it. So y'all can hopefully uh, see it come along and have it and have a pretty good idea of when I'll officially uh, be back and start producing uh, content for everybody. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and bow out for the night um, and probably for the, the next uh, few weeks. Thank you so much uh, for being here tonight. Thank you so much for following me um, this long. And I hope to see everybody back uh, when I finally get back um, online in my new studio. Until next time, take care, everybody.